Um, the way I look at it is that this book is written for adults, so fully grown adults like you and I, and young people that want to know more about the daily experiences they're having on social media and how those experiences are affecting the way they, they think, feel, and behave. What's going on, everybody? Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Black Student Success Podcast, where we bring you insight and guidance from successful Black professionals and students. My name is Selvin, and as always, we appreciate the support. So now we have an exclusive interview with Tyler Hendon. If you didn't check out the episode before, uh, where we talked about his story getting into his HR uh, profession and career, definitely go check that out to give a little bit of context as to what we're going to discuss today day. So uh, what what we're going to do is we're going to talk about his upcoming book release that's called Mirage, The Truth About Social Media. This is a book that was written and independently published by Tyler himself, where he talks about the different aspects of social media, how it's programmed, you know, what the goals are for those different aspects of social media, uh, what are the uh, the you know the different ways that it affects our lives, and then just how to navigate that you know because it's not going anywhere. So how do we navigate this uh, thing that's kind of surrounding our world and balance it with our normal lives? So we're going to talk about a lot of those different things. So again, Tyler, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Good man, I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So let's um, so let's kind of get into maybe like an overview of of the book itself and kind of you know what the goal was, you know what inspired you to write the book and everything. Yeah, so um, I'll start with you know the the inspiration first, right? Uh, so I've had social media for let's say 15 years at this point. So I'm, I'm 30. Um, and I've always been someone that's very observant on social media, right? Like, I, you know, I post and things of that nature, but I've never been someone that's like always posting, or always tweeting or, you know, always on Instagram or whatever it may look like. Uh, and so I think that as time has gone on, I've gotten really interested in wondering like, what makes someone get on like a, like a Twitter and say something like crazy or post something that I would never post, right? Um, and so first I had to kind of look at it and say like, well, you know, Tyler, you're more of a um, um, a shy kind of person. You're more, uh, you know, to yourself. And there are people that are more outgoing than you, right? Uh, but then as I became more interested, I started studying like the nature of the apps. So like, what, how do they work? I got, I got really interested in how do they work? So I started looking at them and saying, okay, I know that I'm using it in this way, but why does it work in that way? And I, I just did this motion, you know, you know, because you I think we can find ourselves all day doing this. Mm-hmm. just like scrolling, scrolling. And then, you know, you look up and you don't even remember what you just saw for like the past five minutes. Or like you might remember a little bit. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I became very interested in wondering why do people interact with the apps in the way that they do? And then I became interested in how do they work? Like. Like, what it is, what is it about this app that led, you know, Snapchat chat to be worth billions of dollars? You know, their CEO is worth like $10 billion. Like, yeah. what is it about this thing that is just so profitable and makes, you know, um, made these companies so powerful and influential? Uh, so really, man, I started studying the people that use the apps, meaning, you know, everyday people like you and me. Um, I started studying and paying attention to the companies. And then I really... Um, began looking at the culture too. So like I started looking at what is the culture of these different social media apps and how is that affecting the world around us? So I think that was my like um, interest. Yeah. Okay. And then what were some of those different things that you found in terms of differences between, you know, a Twitter and an Instagram and then maybe the cultures that are being built around those? Yeah. And that's a really good question. So one of the things I found is that, you know, all the, the algorithms aren't the same. And and essentially an algorithm is like a set of rules, right? So an algorithm helps the app determine um, whatever end result they're trying to get. And that end result could be engagement. So you spending more time on the app and that ultimately gets them to be in a position where they can monetize the experience. And 
monetize uh, essentially means to turn something into money. Um, so I would take time to look at like a Twitter and look at their culture and say like, well, how are people interacting interacting with this this app and talking about their lives here in a different way than they are on Instagram? Um, and what I found, man, is that some things aren't that different. You know, some things are the same in terms of the information that people are willing to put into the world. Um, some of the ways that the different apps make money aren't that different. Uh, but the the culture, though, can be a bit different because if you're talking about a Twitter, Twitter is almost like a personal diary for some people where they get on there and every day they are kind of in some ways just talking to themselves and then other people are able to chime in on that. Um, whereas at Instagram, I think you'll probably hear people say this, Instagram can feel, um, depending on how you use it, right? Because it's different for different people. Instagram can feel almost like a like a highlight reel. You'll hear people say, you know, they're putting their best life on an Instagram. Whereas uh, on a Twitter, you'll hear, you'll, you'll hear someone say like, man, I'm really broke right now. You know, so they can be a bit different. Um, but either way, they put people in a really unique position to be influenced. Um, and by influence, I mean that, you know, man, I've come to believe that these companies, the social media, you know, uh, companies of the world, these huge uh, um, businesses like the Facebook and Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, you know, I think they're some of the most influential companies on the planet right now. Um, because they have a the way, they have a way to directly influence the way people interact with other people. Um, man, they have a way to influence the way that people think, and they have a way to influence the way that you feel. And so, ultimately, if you think about it, or at least in my mind, if I can, you know, impact the way someone thinks, the way they feel, and you know, uh, the way they behave as well, so their behaviors, I can make that person do a lot of different stuff if I chose to, right? Or at the very least, I can learn a lot about that person. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then um, and I like that we are we're using Twitter and Instagram because that those two feel like kind of different things. You know, well, like you said, the the Twitter is more of like the microblogging, and you're uh, you know, like you said, having a conversation with yourself or you're putting something out there for people to actually comment on and maybe start a conversation. I know they recently started the spaces, which is basically Clubhouse and TikTok. So you now have this opportunity to actually just ba basically be able to either talk or even listen into some of those different conversations about whatever they're going about. And then, you know, the, the Instagram is... Um, you know, it's, you know, the highlight reel type of feel, the, you know, putting people on a pedestal and, um, you know, uh, you know, just really being, uh, being influenced by the visuals of something. Um, and, and I know some of your, you know, the topics that you talk about are, um, you know, the, the materialism and a lot of that you can definitely see in Instagram. So uh, I'm sure that with studying all the different things, um, maybe seeing how they've taken pieces from other things, you've um, then kind of have your kind of perspective on how all of them interact with, uh, with each other. And then just with the, you know, surrounding public. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the, the biggest thing I've found is that um, when you really look at them, you know, people choose what they post, right? So it's not like the app is making you do anything, but like the, the cultures of the app and the, the algorithms they're using. So like the science behind the app is so powerful and influencing people, right? And, you know, these people, and I'm, I want to throw TikTok in there as well, you know, these people have really figured out how to um, understand what people want to see when they get online. You know, they have it down to a really smart and well thought out science. And so when you make some of these accounts, depending on the app, you know, based off of how much time you're spending on the app, um, what you're clicking on, what you're stopping on, what you like, what you retweet, what you comment on, it's almost like it's all going into a database, right? And so they're essentially making a profile of you based off of what you're putting out into the world. Mm -hmm. And they're building that profile, you know, kind of piece by piece and in a very fast and efficient way. So they can say like, okay, you know what? We just learned these 10 things about Cell. Now we know that he loves cars or something of that nature. So you know what, um, uh, Motor Trend just paid us $10,000 to run ads. 
So he's going to see one of those ads because we think he might be interested in reading Voter Trend, right? So yeah. they know this stuff so well um, to the point where it's helped them build, you know, these billion dollar businesses. Uh, so it's, it's it's very interesting. And it makes me wonder, um, you know, do people understand how they are being influenced when they go online? Because it can go in more than one way, right? It can be positive and casual um, if we're talking about like our hobbies, you know, and things that aren't a big deal. Um, but at the same time, when we talk about culture, you know, it can also be negative when we're talking about people's everyday lives and how they're influenced and how they are, how they can at least be influenced to believe certain things that may not necessarily be true um, and how they may be influenced to buy into lifestyles that may be not realistic for them. And so those are the kind of things that really motivated me to write the book because I thought about like, you know, how is social media affecting like young people, you know, people that uh, maybe are impressionable and haven't spent as much time in the world or as much time as me, you know, traveling and meeting people, you know, how was it, how are they influenced when they are going through their phone and they're, you know, doing this all day? Like, how does that um, have an impact on their life? Um, and what I found that it's having a huge impact on, on all of us. So. Yeah, absolutely. Especially, especially the, the the younger generation who were basically born into it. Um, you know, with 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 us being millennials, we had actually had some type of um, prototype to, to kind of work with it. You know, to build to what it is now and compare it to how things were in terms of how we communicated with each other. Um, so, which actually brings me to my next question in terms of the you know the audience or who this is intended for you know are you are you going for the millennials who have kind of experienced both sides and seen it grow um are you going for gen z who have been born into it um or is this gonna you know where is this directed towards the next generation alpha you know who have will probably see a lot of different advances you know more than the last generation so who is this book really written for yeah it's a great question man so um, the way I look at it is that this book is written for adults, so fully grown adults like you and I, and young people that want to know more about the daily experiences they're having on social media and how those experiences are affecting the way they, they think, feel, and behave. Um, and any, anyone that follows me is probably going to hear me say think, feel, and behave a lot, uh, but I really think those are the primary things that so, social media is doing to us and able to do to us. Um, when we're getting on these different apps. Uh, so that, those are the groups I really want to target because I want to be able to speak to those parents that like, you know, they have kids that are always on their phone, they're always doing this. And maybe that parent doesn't completely understand why their kid is on that app so much. And then at the same time, maybe that parent doesn't understand how much that app is influencing their child, right? Um, and the culture that they experience on that app um, is influencing their child. Um, and I also want, you know, young people to be able to discern between, you know, what they should be influenced by on social media and what they should be careful of. Because the interesting thing, man, about social media now is that it's like all this information lives within this same space, but there aren't a lot of good barriers around what's true and what's not. So you'll have, you know, truthful information halfway true for information, misinformation, you know, completely false information, all existing within that same space. And so if I'm saying to myself, if I'm young and I'm impressionable and I'm looking at all this stuff at once, how do I determine like what I should buy into and what I should believe and what I should say, oh no, that's not, that's not true. Or maybe I should question that. Um, so I'll say that those are the primary groups, man. And, and lastly, I want to say, you know, really, this book is for people that have maybe in some way allowed social media to impact their feelings and impact maybe their self-confidence or impact the way that they view themselves and the expectations they're putting on themselves. Um, because I do think social media isn't necessarily a bad thing, but with the culture that we're seeing in it now, I think it's setting or has the ability to set an unfair expectation for people in terms of the positions that they should be in, like in life, you know, whether it be uh, our relationship status, um, the jobs that we have, how much we're able to travel, how educated we should be, how much money we should have. 
um, what I'm seeing in the culture is that it's becoming um, a little bit, a little bit tricky and a little bit of a, um, I call it mirage for a reason, right? So it's becoming kind of like a mirage because it looks like one thing, because, you know, because I think you use Twitter like me, you know, you'll see people say, this is goals, this is what you should be doing. But when you really pay attention to it, it might not be that thing. And that thing that they're putting out there, that thing that is becoming big in our culture might not be something you should actually uh, imitate or something that you could even reach on top of that, something that's even realistic for you to try to get to it, whatever point you're in in life. Um, So I really want people that have experienced those emotions and feelings to be able to connect to the book and to be able to just interpret it and get something out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned uh, feelings and 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 just sometimes when you uh, see some type of piece of content and, and it evokes a certain feeling, and then you want to have more. I think you kind of mentioned uh, it, it in some of your book when you're talking about how you know your timeline is basically catered to you. You know, you know whether it's from the the companies or from other people who are like minded and are posting similar you know things. Um, and and yeah, and that that makes you feel you know a, a certain way whether that's good or bad or whatever the case is and then you know because these are platforms where people are given the voice to kind of give their opinion now they're you know now they're in a position to now speak kind of based off of that emotion um or you know without uh without a balance between you know the subjectivity and the objectivity so um so i'm glad that you you know start to kind of dig into these different topics um and, and one of them i want to actually ask you about is you know this idea of cancel culture and so um you know i want to get your perspective on you know what you you know kind of what your opinion is on it um you know like its current state and um you know if there's um if there's anything that you know has room to be changed with that um, Uh, Because, you know, you see things like, you know, most recently, you know, the baby had all the controversy, you know, for at least a couple of weeks and probably still kind of going on. Um, But at the same time, you know, there are people who are skeptic on, you know, him being canceled and say, well, you know, maybe in about a month he's going to bounce back or everybody's going to forget about what happened, you know, you know, four or five weeks ago, whatever the case is. So, um, so what's your opinion on uh, cancel culture and what its current state is? Yeah. Um, and I guess I want to start by um, thanking you so for reading that. Uh, I really appreciate you for, you know, taking the time to um, read some of my work, you know, <clears throat> in, in regards to cancel culture. So I kind of, in the book, I came up with three um, conclusions on it. Um, I think that uh, we should educate people for one before canceling them, right? So educate people. Let's try to teach them a better way if they don't know a better way. Or let's try to teach them why they're, why they're wrong about something before we just throw them away, before we throw them in the trash. Um, second, I think we should try to meet people with empathy. You know, try to understand why someone may feel the way they feel before we judge them or before we say, you know, this person isn't worthy. Um, So empathy and education should come first, right? Let's try to teach people and help them first. Um, Third, I do think there are times when it is um, fair to not necessarily, I I don't like to call it canceling. I would rather say withdraw support. So there are times when it is fair to withdraw support for someone if they have made choices that maybe don't align with their values and what you believe in, or maybe if their choices have hurt you in some way and you say, you know what, I don't want to um, buy into that person anymore because of the choices that they made. Um, And it's funny, man, you know, you brought up the situation with um, that artist, the baby, and, you know, he did essentially go through an experience that I, kind of outlined in the book and saying that, you know, if you make certain choices or you say certain things that people believe to be incorrect, right? And you have a large platform, there are going to be people um, that say you should be canceled. And then more than likely, if that gets enough traction, if that gets enough steam, it's going to impact your life. And it's more than likely going to impact your life in a way that you do not believe to be favorable. Right. So I do think that 
he's a human being, right? So I'm going to say, I'm going to stick to my guns and say, hey, um, if anyone did have the opportunity to interact with him, they should try to, you know, meet him with empathy first in some education, right? Try to teach him why he's wrong and show him like, you know, you said this thing and let me tell you why you shouldn't have. And let me try to be empathetic and try to give you a different path um, so that he can become a better human, right? Try to meet people as humans because we all make mistakes. It's natural for us to do real things, to make mistakes. But at the same time, I have to be respectful to the people who maybe he disrespected. And maybe those people that are saying, you know what? I can't believe he did that. That hurt me. I can no longer support this person. So I respect those people as well because I understand why they may feel the way that they feel. Um, But over anything, man, I really think that we need to understand that great people can do like dumb stuff. You know, we can all have the ability. That's I think that's what makes us human, though. Like um, if even if even when you take it back to like old Bible stories, like at least in my experience, the only person that was perfect in the Bible is Jesus. Right. Mm -hmm. Everybody else you see, like they could have done something really great. And then there's someone else somewhere else in the story where they did something that wasn't right. Or they didn't align with, um, excuse me, or they didn't align with um, what they were supposed to do, right? Uh, so I think that's where I'm at with it, man. Like, let's meet people with with humanity and try to help them. And then after that, you know, go in a different direction. If we can't, if that person can't learn or grow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's a, that's a really good uh, approach to that whole thing because it's, I think it's hard to get to that first point where, um, you know, if we go back to the whole emotions thing, especially if you're seeing it first on social media and it's getting spread and then you've got, you know, media sources that are putting like different titles and now that's more more sensationalized and everything. Um, I think it's difficult to get to that point of meeting people, you know, just kind of with that empathy and then trying to educate. But you do see those different efforts. Like I believe that, you know, there was a, a group or a number of groups that, you know, put together a letter, you know, to send to him um, just to basically at least start a conversation as opposed to just straight out condemning them. So, um, and I feel like that takes the work on both sides for the, the person who is, you know, in the, um, the offensive role to actually be receptive of that, especially if they've gotten all this bashing for the first two weeks of that. I'm sure they're ready to shut everybody out. Um, but then at the same time for that audience to, you um, and that's not to say that they, you know, anybody can't react at the way they want or, or feel that the way they want, but having a, I guess, a productive way of doing that to be able to, to move forward. Um, because, you know, with, with it's like, a, it seems like a high and then it kind of falls off and then there isn't anything that kind of goes over. Like you just have the reaction and then there isn't any, um, you know, what is the resolution after that? So, so I, I like your approach when it comes to just, trying to meet people, um, get some understanding, and then finding a, a good way to move forward where everybody kind of feels in, enlightened in some way. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. So, it, yeah. No, do you have a point that you want to make? Oh, no, just a quick thing, man. I was going to say, you know, it's it's really interesting because I think that we have such an ability to not – be empathetic or understanding when we're just looking at something on our phone right so when you know we have information coming across our phone it's super easy to like just say someone sucks when you just say i can just type it out Mm -hmm. or to say you know this person should never work again like it's really easy to do that so i that's why i'm saying i think empathy should be stronger we should try to show people more empathy and try to help people more because that's the it's the tougher route. And I think that if more people met each other with grace, I think it make it would make life a little bit easier when people are online, you know, because it's like, you know what, if I make a mistake, almost like with your close friends, like you can see them make a mistake and say, well, I'm not just going to try to throw you away. I'll try to help you. Like if more people try to help each other, I think that we'd see less of cancel culture and more people realizing that. You know, we are we are all humans. There are going to be people that, you know, we withdraw support from or choose not to support. But we maybe should think twice before we just judge people and say they should just be thrown in the trash. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, Now, how do you personally try to find the balance between, you know, 
your life and you know what's being shown on social media um i know that you you made a point in terms of uh you know basically what we see or what we're consuming you know we can fall into the trap of making that connection to our real life and kind of making that synonymous um you know without making the effort to kind of differentiate and and, and compartmentalize um, how do you personally do that or what are some of the things that you kind of try to make sure that you do as you're kind of consuming social media and then you know on the other end kind of going back to your real life yeah that's a great question man um so I, honestly i would say I've learned to not take it as seriously. Um, like I, I don't spend as much time looking at my timeline and like, and I know some people maybe not like this response, but like, I don't believe people as much as I used to, you know, like I, I see things and it's like, that's cool. Like I'm happy for people and I see people traveling and doing a lot of different cool things, but I don't buy into it as much as I used to. Um, and so when I've spent less time buying into it and really believing what I was seeing all the time, um, it, it makes you a little bit more relieved or at least make me a little bit more relieved about my own life because it's like, OK, that person could be doing great. They could not be doing great. Like, I don't really know, but I'm still going to like their picture and just keep it moving and be happy for them. Right. Um, but I would say that's number one, man. Two, um, I've spent. I try to spend less time on the apps than I used to. So I try to limit my screen time. Um, if I have to really focus on something, like I'll delete the apps off my phone and say, you know, I'm just going to give this a break for even, even man, if it's for like a day or two days or whatever, like, you know, let me just take a little break because I know I got to do this thing. I got to really zone in. Um, so trying to limit the time I spend on the apps. Um, and really, man, I would also say, as I've learned more and more information, it's just helped me to um, kind of not necessarily make social media as much as a priority in my life, but more so like um, an addition that's cool to have when I'm ready to engage in it. Um, you know, man, I read this really cool book by this author called um, Ad Adam Alter. He wrote a book called Irresistible and it was revolving around screen time. And in the book, he mentioned how like some of these like CEOs and um, important people at these companies, at these tech companies don't even allow like their kids and family to engage in social media or their kid might not have an iPad or their kid may not be able to watch certain shows because they know the impact it can have on your mental health. So I think that I try to just limit it and just be careful like if it's a weekend i'll find myself just scrolling through that whatever just because i'm relaxing right but if it's like on the weekday and i really have some stuff to do i have to mentally tell myself like tyler look you need to disengage from that because you have other things that are more important in the world and one thing i've learned man is that social media will catch you up really quickly mm -hmm. you know like if you if you if something happened you know, well, today's Sunday. Kanye, I think he just officially put out his album today. Like, if I didn't have um, Twitter or whatever today, if I took it off my phone and I got on it tomorrow, I would quickly see, or I would quickly find that Kanye put out his album yesterday. So it's like, it, the information's always there and it's going to be there for you. It's not going anywhere. You're not missing out on anything. You can get back to it really quickly. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, I think. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And, and, and uh, I, you know, sometimes I think we underestimate how, how much the information is being pushed to us. Like I always remember, and it's not even necessarily social media, but just Google in general. So if you were to open up a new window and you're kind of scrolling to see all the different like news things, it's all tailored to what you've looked at before. So if it is something like, you know, you're a big Kanye fan um, and you like took out every social media app you're going to find that information is it's gonna it's gonna be put into your face one way or another so um that's really a really good point to make um and and if i could add to that i would say even just kind of use utilizing social media with purpose so that you're not finding yourself endlessly sc uh, scrolling through and you know like you know like you said maybe if it's like the weekend or if you know that you don't have you know um you know um x y and z to do then you you know, have the time to to kind of you know relax and just kind of freely go through that. Um, but if you don't, if you're just like, okay, I'm going to open up Instagram because that's what I do every day 
at 8 26 in the morning you know <laughs> and then you're just kind of going through it with nothing really that you're kind of looking for then yeah like you said that's how you can really get caught up yeah yeah absolutely there you go. So um, so for our listeners, especially with some of them being, you know, either in college or even, you know, before college and then some afterwards, um, what was the process like of, you know, writing the book and especially independently publishing it? Um, because, I, you know, I've hear that, you know, if you're kind of going through that process of writing and you've gotten your drafts and everything's edited and now you, you're trying to actually put it out there. If you're trying to go through a publisher, that's going to actually, you know, cost you a pretty penny. So. Um, but I can also imagine that, you know, going the independent route gives you a lot more freedom. So can you talk about what that process was like just in general? Yeah. So um, it, it was a really interesting process because I started by just writing notes on my phone. Like I had just all these ideas. So I would just go on my phone and I'm just like, OK, whenever I had an idea, I'm just I'm going to write it down, write it down. And so I just had just a mountain of notes in my notes app. Right. Yeah. And eventually I moved that on to Word. Um, and I said, okay, now I have all this information. I need to do something with this information, right? It has to make sense in some way or another. Um, so what I've been told, man, and, and people that I really paid attention to and what I've learned, you know, what I truly believe is that you need to start with a very well-written book. Like there's no better marketing than your product being a great product. You know, word of mouth is still really, really important. Um, and if there are people in the world that can speak to the quality of what you produce, you'll be able to figure it out. You know, it's I don't think it's any different than like your favorite restaurant or anything else we consume that people can say like, oh, yeah, that's that's the place you need to go to because their food is great. That can go a long way coming from person to person. Um, I think a product like an independently published book really isn't that different because if there are people that are reviewing your book on let's say the Amazons and um you know targets of the world and these websites where your book is going to be um and they say hey this is a great product you know that can go a long way so I tell people start with doing something that is going to be a good topic for you to write on and that you're going to do your best to get the you know, the high quality of the writing. Um, two men, you know, it's really, and I had to learn this kind of the hard way. It's really a business. Mm. It's really a business. Like, unless you're a person that you want to just um, publish a book for you to consume, or maybe just people locally, like in your community to consume. Um, if you're not in that situation and you're saying, hey, I want to sell, I want to be a best-selling author or something of that nature, it is a business 100% because you need to hire an editor. You need to hire a formatter. Um, you need, and you probably go through more than one round of edits. And the interesting thing about edits is they might charge you by the page. They can charge you by the word, but either way, you're going to spend some money. Um, you need to hire someone to do your cover design. You need to think about the money you're going to spend on market. How are you going to market? Who is your target market? How do they consume information? Like it's very much like you're starting a business and that business is this book. And then you're pushing that out into the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I would tell anyone, like, if you're really serious about it, understand that it's going to cost time and money. It's going to cost time. It's going to cost money. And you're going to have to invest in it time and time again for it to be, you know, what you want it to be. Um, and I would say the last thing, man, is, you know, independently publishing and having a like a book deal right or being a published author can be different and i don't think that there's like a perfect way to go for each well let me take a step back i think that the way to go for each person can be different right because some people may say you know what i'm a great nonfiction author i could write the next best harry potter book but I really hate marketing. I have no interest in marketing. I have no interest in editing this myself. You know, so that person may be in a better boat if they decide to pursue a major publisher and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to get less of the 
royalties because I'm working with a major publisher and that's what they do. They, you know, say, hey, we'll give you this, but this is everything we're giving you. Um, that person may be in a better position to say, you know what, I don't want to start a business. I just want to write a great, you know, nonfiction book or whatever that looks like. Um, but if you're like me, who's more entrepreneur, entrepreneurial, you may say, you know what, I can do the marketing. I can do editing. I can understand the formatting. I can teach myself how to use Photoshop so that I can make things look the way I want them to look. I can run, you know, my book's Instagram page and Facebook and all that stuff. So it's really, man, just situational because it depends on a person. But either way, it, it takes a lot of hard work if you're trying to do it on a high level. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the, the two highlights from that, I think just the, the hard work, no matter which route you take, it's, it's yes. going to take time and money. Um, and then secondly, I think just that process of you identifying what you want to do or what you can do or what you're willing to do um, and what you're not willing to do or what you don't want to do. And, you know, where it, that, that allows you to align your focus on those things. And, you know, like you said, from the beginning, just writing a really good book. Um, and, um, and then, you know, if it is, you know, a situation like you where it's like, okay, you know, I understand the idea of marketing. I kind of do this in, you know, my day to day or whatever the case is, or I understand what the, the thing is. Yeah, I can do that. I can, I can do that and still put out a quality book. Um, just that process of just kind of, you know, making that list. Okay. These are my, these are my, I can, I can do these things. And then these are my deal breakers and then moving forward that way. Um, so that's actually really, really good. And just explaining even the process of being on the independent side of those different people that you have to hire. Um, because, you know, I didn't even think about the, I didn't think about the book cover or, um, having to go through more than one round of editing like you know i you know think you would just you know get that one editor go through it and then you're good but you know again you know you you'll they'll probably find some things you know you know from a technical standpoint that you probably didn't because you were just so focused on the content itself so um so a lot of great points in just kind of what your process was like yes sir thank you for summing that up for me i know i i know i said a lot but it is it is really interesting man because books take a lot of work, more, more work than I honestly thought at first. I thought like, oh, I'm going to crank this out. Like, no, <laughs> it's, been, it's been, it's been about a year and a half, almost two years in the making. So okay, it, it takes time, but if you do want to take it really seriously, you know, it's almost like anything, you know, it takes time and energy. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Cool. And now finally, before we wrap up everything, Tyler, now, if there was one thing that you could change about social media, that could be, um, you know, removing all the apps and just, you know, people talking to each other in person, or if it's something, you know, with a particular app that you would want to see in terms of a, a feature, whether that's linked to the things that you talked about in your book, or just something that you personally would want to see, um, what would that be and why? Yeah, that's a great question, man. Um, if I could change one thing about social media, I would change the pieces of social media culture that negatively impact people's mental health. Mm. So those pieces that make, you know, young people feel like they're not enough. Mm -hmm. All those pieces that make adults feel like they're not successful or, you know, their relationship isn't where it needs to be or those, you know, those parts of it that make us, um, a little bit deprived or that can make us a little bit deprived um, when we log on and we're seeing all these different images. Um, so I would say I would change that. And then I just have to add this one in, man. I would change the amount of misinformation we see on social media. So the amount of information we see being fed to us and shared by us, often shared by regular people, just like you and I, you know, all this information that's out there that um, may not necessarily and sometimes just isn't true at all. But when it comes to really important and prevalent information, um, I would absolutely change that piece of it because, you know, every day we see like information being shared that isn't accurate. And it's not on like silly things like, you know, who's like opinionated things, like who's the best NBA player of all time. You know, that it's not like, Stuff about that, I don't worry about. I don't worry about like the debates. I don't worry about like when people say, you know, should a man pay all the bills and stuff like that. Like mm -hmm. that stuff is just conversation. What I worry about is like when someone says like, 
you know, the Moderna vaccine is going to do this to your body. And then it gets like 5,000 retweets. And I know in some way or another that could really make someone believe, oh, there's no way I would, you know, take that vaccine because it's going to do the X to me. And where people fall on vaccines, that's not my business, right? That's their business. But what I worry about is like when that information that isn't true is influencing the way you, you know, think, feel, and behave. That's what I worry about because that happens on a day-to-day basis. So um, just to sum it up, man, I would say the parts of the culture, social media culture that, you know, negatively affect, you know, our mental health and two, just the amount of information, well, misinformation that's being shared, you know, by us. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 those are, and those are really good. And I, I think, you know, the, the first points, um, the one about, you know, just kind of taking like negative information or comments or whatever the case is. Um, and I would want to think that there are some kind of filters that are out there, you know, for maybe at least like the, the, the information coming from certain sources, not necessarily people who are commenting on things, but, um, you know, I, that would be cool if, if there was some kind of filter that could kind of like read words or phrases and then kind of put them up into a box somewhere, uh, you know, some kind of virtual cloud box or whatever the case is. So, um, you know, just to, 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 to take some of that off because you can't take the steps of just not being there. Um, but, you know, with it being so, you know, prevalent and then especially you know, if you're not necessarily in your professional life yet, you've got a little bit of time and you kind of want to be in the know. Uh, Maybe you want to even share things that are happening in your life. And so you want to have some type of presence there. So um, sometimes removing yourself may not be the best option, um, even for your mental health in that case, just depending on the person. So, um, you know, that would be cool if there was a little filter that could kind of just move things into a, you know, a a separate, uh, separate account or something like that. Yeah, it would absolutely be cool, man. And, you know, I've seen, you know, Twitter and Instagram and a few other platforms work on, you know, labeling certain information, um, which I think is really great that they're doing. They'll label something and say, you know, this could potentially be misinformation or this may not be aligned with what, you know, we've seen it be true. I think uh, we need more of that kind of, um, not to lack, for lack of a better word, I would say policing. And only when it comes to like important stuff, like opinionated stuff is fine because we can all have opinion on different things. But when it mm-hmm. comes to like really like important information that can impact our lives, right? That stuff we really should be careful about sharing information on that stuff that isn't true. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, well, 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 Tyler, thank you so much for for sharing your experience and you know what this process is with uh, with your Mirage book. Any last words, either about the book or just anything that we've been talking about that you want to get out before we wrap up? Uh, just quickly, man. Thank you for allowing me, you know, to be on your platform. Uh, two, I really think that this book is like a tool, and you know, I don't think anyone has read more self help books to me like I've always been someone that just read a lot of books so I think it's natural what I'm doing but I really want the book to be used as like a tool that people can use to to just help themselves and to help others and to share it you know read it share it with somebody else give it away do whatever you choose to do with it but um, ultimately I think it'll make has the ability to make life a little bit easier you know for a few people when they get online and when they're you know scrolling through their phone all day um and two, just, you know, the book will be available mid-November. Um, the website is themiragebook.com. Um, I have like some free previews on there, and just some different information. Um, and people will be able to go to my website and purchase it and, you know, get a link to Amazon or buy it on there. Um, and then they can also find more information about the book on Facebook and Instagram. If they just search uh, Mirage book, they'll be able to find me pretty easy. Okay, perfect, perfect. And we'll make sure to have all that information in the description. So again, Tyler, thank you so much for being on the podcast. And thanks to everybody who's been watching and listening. Uh, you know, be sure to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and uh, Facebook. That's at Inquire Hire. Check out our website, inquirehire.com. And we have our newly open um, online community where we connect different uh, Black students and professionals to make more meaningful connections, as well as getting uh, a, a one-stop shop of all the different resources to help with your growth. So uh, check us out there. And until next time, peace. Peace.